Okay, so we're going to begin with, as we do, we recap the end of the previous class. So we were discussing, you know, we discussed in the past few classes how the snake convinced Chava and enticed her to sin and the back and forth and why would she listen and she didn't want to listen, but eventually she fell into the trap by him being very sly and smart. He convinced her on a physical emotion level, on a more spiritual level, on a halachic level, fulfilling the purpose of the world, elevating the bad, serving God with higher purpose and fulfilling the purpose of the world, etc. And then we find discussed how she actually ate the fruit and she sinned and then she gave it to her husband. And now after they sinned, we're in this portion now over here dealing with this idea of after the sin. And they are in the forest and we explain that they hid in the tree in the middle of the garden, which seems to indicate that they, according to Rashi, the simple meaning, they actually hid in the fig tree, which is the tree that they sinned in. We discussed, we discussed that idea of when you want to repent for something, you have to make sure that you repent with the, the matter that you sinned in. If you sinned with not eating kosher, then you got to repent with eating kosher, not with talking nicely to somebody. That's great, but that's not fixing what you, what you did. So they had to, we discussed that he hid specifically under that tree. Why did he hide under that tree? You'd think he would run away from the tree, but he specifically went under that tree because the holiness is according to the level God reveals himself according to the level of holiness that's there and because they had sinned with that tree the holiness was on a lower level there and therefore he said I sin now I'm on a low level I won't be able to tolerate I'm not going to be able to handle such a high level of holiness and therefore I'm going to go under this tree where the level of holiness is a little bit lighter. I'll be able to handle this. And then we discuss how does Hashem start this conversation? He starts this conversation by saying, Ayepa, where are you? And we said, this doesn't make sense. What, of course, God knows where they are. God sees everything. God knew that they were hiding under that tree. So why is he asking? Simply, we said, it means, you know, start of conversation. Hello, how are you? Where are you? But we went into the deeper explanation by bringing a story um, from the Alta Rebbe, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, where he explained that this means, where are you holding? Where are you holding? What's going on? And that if you want to repent, that's the first step. You have to be honest with yourself. And you have to look inside and you have to say, where am I holding? Where am I? And only if you're honest with yourself and you could admit, I made a mistake, then can you climb up that ladder? And we said that this is a lesson constantly, constantly for all of us. God, this was said to Adam, the first man after he sinned. And Hashem said, where are you? Where are you holding? And this is a lesson for us every single day of our lives. We should be asking ourselves, where are you? Where am I holding? Where? And that's the way that we can climb the ladder and grow in our Yiddishkeit, grow in our Judaism and become closer to Hashem. So that was, you know, we went a lot, we discussed a lot about that, um, about, you know, about that idea. And the last idea that we discussed last class was this idea of Adam's response. Adam's response when Hashem said, what did you do? Why did you do this? His response was, well, the wife that you gave me, she gave me to eat. So in other words, he shifted the blame to, he shifted the blame to Chava. B, you have a question? I do. What do you mean by holding? 
where what are you holding where are you holding where are you holding means like where are you what level are you on be honest with yourself like am i am i holding when you say where are you holding like at what point are you in life am i working on myself as much as i sh- as much as i should am i being am i an honest person am i fulfilling the torah and the mitzvahs am i learning properly where am i holding what am i doing Oh, okay. With my life. And we discussed many times, it came up a lot last class, like we now have this choice in front of us since Adam and Chava sinned, whether you liked it or not, they got the choice. Eat from the tree, have the the option of having good or bad or not. Once they ate from it, too late. It's in the world and that's it. So we we now just have the choice to choose between evil and good. But we never have the choice to say like evil's not in the world until Mashiach comes. When Mashiach comes, we're working from the time that Adam and Chava sinned until Mashiach comes, which will be very soon. The Lubavitcher Rebbe actually gave a prophecy in 1991 saying that the coming of Mashiach is imminent, meaning it's going to be soon. And he explained at different times that it's gonna be in you know, this generation in this, in this time period. So, you know, it's going to be soon. We've been working on this for over 2,000 years since the time we got the Torah and even before that from the time of Adam, where we're really working on elevating the bad and transforming it. But until that point, we don't have the choice of saying there will be no evil. Let's turn that button off. We have it and we have to always constantly where it says battle. We have our evil inclination that's telling us, no, this really looks very good. Just like we saw all the tactics of the snake. Eh, God doesn't really care if you don't, you're not so particular. So you won't light candles in time. Light it three hours later. No, that's a sin. You can't use a flame on Shabbos. We're not supposed to do that. So he, he, or he tells you, we went through so many different tactics that he tries to tell you the, the physical world looks so good. It's so enticing or what many, many different tactics that we've discussed over all these classes but that's what we're living with now. We're living that we always have this and we have the choice. Do we want to listen or do we want to not? But it's not easy. And that's one of the other things we discussed last class, that that's why they sold the clothing. Because once we already have the option to use our body, which is symbolic of using any physical for bad, not to serve Hashem for mundane things, once we have that option, we need to protect ourselves because it's not easy to just say, I'm going to do what's right, right? I didn't make a plan and I'm here and there's all this good, delicious foods and I know it's not good for me, you know, whatever it is, the person has diabetes or if you don't make a plan and you don't say, well, I don't want to do this and I, and let me make some protection. I'm going to have other food. If I'm starving and this is the only food, what am I going to do? So you need to have that, protection of how am I going to protect myself? What am I going to do? How am I going to be in the right place at the right time with the right things, the right people, learn the things that will fortify me to withstand all this, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we have to do now at this point. So when Hashem says, where are you holding? He asks us this every day, you know, where are you holding? Where are you in your path? Because if you don't look yourself in the mirror, and be honest with yourself and say, where am I? It's very hard to improve and to become a better person. As we discussed last time, the story, you know, with the 10 chickens, only giving really what you have, not things that, you know, theoretically I have, I'm offering, you know, rubies and diamonds and gold that I don't own as opposed to 10 chickens or whatever it is that I actually do own. That was just a parable. Um, and the story with the cards that, you know, the cards were his own pocket. He didn't look at his own pocket. No one usually looks in their own pocket. So we got to look inside and be honest with ourselves, see what we're holding. And then that is the impetus for growth. So now the last thing that we ended off last class with was that, as I started to say um, before we asked her question, which was a great question. I'm happy you asked it, was was 
the idea of blaming somebody else for that Adam blamed Chava. And he said, this is human nature. We're constantly blaming other people, you know, for what they do, which is actually here where I said the story with the, with the cards, that we can't blame someone else. And we have to look at ourselves in the mirror and not say, well, this person got me to do this. And at the end of the day, it might be harder because the other person tempted you, but you're always responsible for your own actions. If this came up to, it means it's a test. If somebody gave you something and made it really difficult, they were so rude to you and you just, you know, you say, well, they made me scream. No one makes you scream. It's always your choice whether you're going to scream or not. Yes, it was way more challenging because this person came to me and was so rude, but Hashem obviously sent that person as a messenger and that was to test you. And now you have the choice. Am I going to do this or am I not? Am I going to react calmly or react in the way that's proper? Maybe I do have to put this person in the place, but how am I going to do that? Am I going to do it in the best way? And when it's wrong, I say, well, it's only because they, you know, because of them that they did this and this and that. Yeah, life is more challenging that way. But in the end of the day, we are always responsible for our own actions. As we learned from the story of Lazar ben Dai, who tried to get the mountains, which is symbolic of parents. We blame it on the parents or on the sun, the moon, and the stars, which is our fate, or on our, our, our community, our surrounding, our friends. And in the end, you realize, no, if I want to do tshuva, it has to come from me. So we always have to be honest with ourselves and say, if I want to change, if I want to repent, we're always repenting, by the way, because we're always making mistakes. So it doesn't mean I had to do some big evil sin. It could be, you know, a simple thing as I could have smiled at someone and I did it. It doesn't have to be major. Um, I'm sure, you know, I'm talking about myself that I always have a lot to work on. I'm sure all of you are at a much higher level than me and have a lot less to work on, but I'm just, you know, sharing open, you know, openly here. So now we're going to, um, we're going to move on. And we're going to go to Psukim Yodalid through Tesvav, which is 14 and 15, the next two Psukim. And in these two Psukim, we already had the conversation that was over here. Could everyone see the board properly? Does everyone see the board? Yes. 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 Okay, good. Excellent. I don't see 14. No, no, I didn't get there yet. I want to first <laughs> show you. Good. Now I know you're really looking and not just saying yes. So that's why I said. We did this. We did eight. So let's just recap. We did our introduction that they were both naked. That's what led to the whole story that the, the, the snake saw them in this way. Additionally, that shows that the level that they were on, that they were so pure that they didn't even realize they were unclothed, and that's, and then we have the snake convinces Chava, that was Sukkim Al of Thuhe, verses one to five. Then we have the effect of the sin, that now, look, she's able to see things in a different way. She has this wisdom, she has the knowledge of good and evil. And then we have the conversation with Hashem. Now that she sinned, Hashem is conversing and saying, you know, hey, what's going on? Where are you? Why did you sin? Oh, Chava caused me to sin. And then here we are, the snake's punishment. Okay, so Adam said, Chava gave it to me. Chava said, well, the snake convinced me. Okay, so here we are. It's officially the snake who got them into this mess. And here is the snake's punishment. So what does it say? And Hashem said, God said to the serpent, to the snake, Ki asisa zais, because you have done this, aror ata, cursed you will be. How will you be cursed? What does the Pasa continue to say? Mikol habehema, from all the animals, mikol chayas asada, and meaning more than, more than all the cattle and more than all the beasts of the field. 
So that is curse number one. You're going to be more cursed than all the other animals. Now we go on to curse number two. And you shall walk on your belly. So remember what I said, the snake used to be upright like a human person standing on two feet, upright with two hands. And now he says, you're going the way we see him today, the snake, you're going to walk on your stomach. You are no longer going to be standing upright like the human person. That's punishment number two. Punishment number three, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. So punishment number three is you are going to eat dust. That's going to be your food from now on. Forever, you're going to eat dust. Okay, Pasuk Vav, verse 15. Uvein ha'isha, uvein zar'acha, uvein zar. And I shall place hatred between you and between the woman, and between your seed and between her seed. So he's telling him, the fourth punishment now is that there's going to be hatred between you and Chava. And you loved her, you really, but now... As your punishment, there is going to be this hatred. And in addition to being this hatred, there it's not only going to be between you and Chava. This hatred is going to also be between your children and her children for future generations. This is going to continue the hatred between man and the snake. And what's going to happen? Who Yeshuvcha Reish? which means he will crush your head and you will bite his heel. So that is the last punishment. So just to make sure we, just to recap, he is cursed. How is he cursed? He is more cursed than all the animals. That's curse number one. Be cursed more than all the animals. You will walk on your belly Curse, that is the second punishment. Eating dust is the third, and the hatred between the man and the and the snake, which he explains that the the human is going to crush the snake's head, and the human uh, and the snake will bite the human's heel. So that is um, that. That's these verses, which simply is telling us the punishments of the punishments of the snake. So now let's discuss the punishments of the snake. So before we even go into that, I actually want to, I'm gonna pull up the screen for a minute again, because I wanna show you, I wanna highlight some words here and ask your opinion on it. So these words right over here, where it says, ki asisa zeis, because you have done this. Here in the English, um, you see that little arrow that I have on it? Because you have done this. On those words, is there any question? Now to just show you Let's look in the previous pasuk, in the previous, and Hashem says to Chava, what is this that you have done? And now he's talking to the snake, and he says, because you have done this. Does anybody have a question on this? Because he conceived, he tricked the lady, the um, Chava. I'm at the in verse 13, he says to Chava, What have you done? And when he's talking to the snake, he says, Because you have done this. In the one case, he's asking a question, the other is making a statement. Exactly. So, what question do we have? Right on, spot on, B. What question do we have? Does anyone have a question on that? 
Actually, doesn't God know what the question, uh, what have you done? Doesn't Hashem know everything that's happening altogether? Right. Hashem knows, but, you know, in a very simple sense, when you say, what have you done? Meaning, why did you do this wrong? What's going on over here? But as as you explained, B, Amy, you want to say what you think? Uh, is I'm just, I'm just question. questioning. I'm, I'm just wondering if, in other words, he had advised um, Chava to um, to eat the apple and feed it to her husband, but he didn't do anything. I mean, in other words, it's two different doings because Chava and Adam they ate the apple. He he didn't do anything. He was speaking. It's okay, different. good. So okay, we have we have two really great questions here from you, very bright woman. And so one question that we have. Oh, Ellen, you have another question. Yeah, I have a question also. When uh, Hashem said to Chava, what is this that you have done? He already attributes the fact that she has the ability to determine what she has done. He gives her the, she, we, he already sees that she has that mentality. The snake, he said. Hi. On this. Oh, okay. So it's, let me take these out. Let's pull up the seat. Okay, sorry, I, I just muted her. Go ahead and continue. So it's just different different levels of consciousness. Right, so repeat that last line because I couldn't hear it because there was background noise. If you could just repeat that last line again, I would appreciate that. Tim asked her what she has done, but he told right. the Akash what he has done. It's different levels of consciousness here. Exactly, exactly. Okay, great. So you're on the same uh, page as B. Where we're basically explaining that in to the snake, why is he treating the snake differently? You know, to Chava, he says, what did you do? That's a question. That's an opportunity for them to respond, right? What have you done? She could say, well, I didn't really do this. I meant to do that. Um, you know, and as Ellen's saying, it's a different state of conscious, like, it's already here established, you know, it's established that she's done something, but it's still like, okay, like you can get yourself out of it. Maybe you want to give an explanation. Maybe there's some wiggle room, you know, let's hear your side. And then to the snake, what does he say? Doesn't give him any opportunity. He says, what have you done? You are cursed. That's it. No explanation, no room to respond. So, the answer is that the snake, and it actually is very interesting because it's also going to touch upon what Amy was asking, that she said why the snake actually didn't really do anything. He didn't actually eat from the tree. Like other Mojave were commanded, you're not allowed to eat from the tree. You're not allowed to eat whatever we said it was, the fig or the pomegranate or you know whichever explanation you're going to go according to what it was. You're not allowed to eat that. They take the fruit. They eat it. God said you can't eat the fruit. They ate the fruit. They did an action that they were not allowed to do. Sin, straight out. Adam, he just got them. As Amy said, he was only talking. He didn't actually sin. He just got them to sin. Oh, actually, this is our answer. Amy's question is really our answer. It, it um, teaches us that the snake, the nachash, was what we call a mesis. A mesis means somebody who causes, who entices another person. Somebody who causes somebody else to sin. And in Chomish Devarim, which is the last book, we're doing the first book, now we're just barely <laughs> scratching the edge here. But in the last book of the Torah, it talks about a mesis. It talks about a false prophet, and it talks about you know, serving idol worship, if the whole city serves idol worship, and it, which is called the Irni Dachas. And it discusses all three of these are sort of put together, the false prophet and the Masis, the enticer, and the, 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 the pushed city, because all three of them are serving a Vaidazara, serving idol worship. The false prophet tells, uh, tells people to serve idols. And the Masis, which is the enticer, he also gets people to serve idol worship and to rebel against Hashem. But the difference between the two of them is 
that the prophet comes, I have a prophecy from God, and he comes very public and established. And the enticer comes more, it's, it's more done like in a private, to an individual, quietly, like much more soft. That's like, this is the snake. Snake is the mace. The third thing that I brought up was the, it was, it's a whole city also uh, serving idol worship. But when it talks about the enticer, it says that he must be killed. Why must he be killed? I mean, so does the, the, the false prophet also has to be killed. But it says that he must be killed because getting someone else to sin in a certain sense is worse than sinning yourself. So even though he only spoke, but he got them to sin and he worked overtime in order to do that. And it, as a matter of fact, it says in Devarim over there that when it discusses this in, in Rashi, it brings there that we don't transform the merit of the enticer. What does this mean? When somebody, when someone is brought to court guilty, so after they leave court, if you find more evidence that they're innocent, you could bring it back and you could switch it and say, okay, now we found evidence, let's revisit this and, you know, show how he's innocent and try to prove his innocence. But it says when it comes to a Macy's to show you, to show you how strict this enticer is that someone who tries to get someone to rebel against God that you are not allowed, in Mahaplan Zuchus Eshel Mesis, you're not allowed to transform his, him to merit. So once he leaves the court and it was determined and finalized that he is guilty, we're not allowed to change it after that. That's showing how severe and how strict this really is. So um, bottom line, getting another person to sin is terrible and in a way more severe and that's why the snake is being told you did this as opposed to any opportunity to answer for himself and that also answers amy's question of well he just spoke he didn't just speak he got someone else to sin and in a certain sense that's worse other mahava are also going to be punished which we'll get to in the next probably next class um and we'll see they're not they're not you know let off free they sinned but this is being put first to show getting someone else to sin is more severe in certain but sense. Did, but didn't, um, this is Sarah, didn't um, Hashem ultimately um, use the snake for good? And so he reversed his purpose because when Moshe went to Pharaoh, um, he threw down his rod and it became a snake. So it was being used for Hashem's purpose. And that was the same mate that Moshe used for all of the- um, uh, The makos, the, the makos. plates. So, right. um, so in, a, in a certain sense, um, yeah, everything, that's one of the lessons that we're learning here. They brought evil into the world and it doesn't mean now we live in a bad place. It means now we just have choice to use it for good or to use it for bad. And we have to decide what we're using it for. So Adam now has the choice. So yes, a snake can be used in a positive way. And Moshe did use it in a positive way, but many people don't. And you know, it's, it is the symbol of the Yetzirah and of our evil inclination. And we're supposed to use our animal soul and our evil inclination. We're always supposed to use that to serve Hashem and to use it for good. We definitely most certainly are supposed to do that, but it's just not so easy. But of course, every day, every day, all of you use your animal soul. You have your evil inclination. Ah, I'm so lazy. I'd rather do this. Why should I go on to the class today? You know, why should I call my friend? I'd rather just, you know, watch some TV now. And no, we, we withstand that. And then we use our body, which can be used for either good or bad. It's materialistic. And we use it to serve Hashem instead. And we overcome our Yetzirah and we transform it. And that is the idea. Yes, B. 
isn't this concept of uh, enticement the basis for our, our modern court system? If they, I, I read uh, all the time that someone was enticed by the law and they would not have done uh, whatever the deed was that they were accused of and gotten themselves in more trouble, it would seem to arise from this. I don't know if I'm correct in my assessment, but. So you're, I, I'm not, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not like so familiar with uh, with law. One day, hopefully I'll study it, but. Yeah, no, but it happens all the time. That happens all the time, whether the police or the FBI. Yeah, yeah, no, no. So I'm familiar with that, obviously. I'm not living in, in, in the dark here, but. Um, so what you're, I just want to make sure I'm understanding what you're saying, that a lot of people are let off from the crime they did because they have the excuse, well, he wasn't mentally stable, well, the police kind of let him into this. Is that what you're trying exactly. to say? Exactly. Okay. okay. Just making and sure that I'm understanding. Is, yeah. That's part of the thing. And uh, just one other uh, comment. Um, but I, I want to add to that because I think you brought out such a good point, B, and that is that Yes, someone might have enticed you, but in the end of the day, you are responsible. Adam and Chava were responsible, even though someone enticed them. And it actually says that when Mashiach comes, one of the descriptions it gives about Mashiach is, it says that he is going to judge with smell. And it says, what does that mean? He's going to judge with smell. And it says when a person faints, one of the ways to revive them is to give them something strong to smell and that revives them. So we see that smell goes very deep down into your core and it could revive a person. And so when it says he's going to judge with smell, it means he's going to be able to see the essence of a person. And he's going to be able to see all those layers deep down and see the full picture. Like what really caused him to do this, what is his mental capacity, his emotional, et cetera. But nowadays, no matter what happens, the court can never be 100% sure that they gave the right verdict because they never really know what's going on. And they don't really know, but a lot of times that's given as an excuse. Oh, he, he, you know, he's not mentally stable. Well, if he killed five people, even if he's not emotionally stable, we're not, okay, fine but he's still responsible. And are we going to let him be on the loose to kill another five people? No, that's, that's crazy. So no one could really see. So they might want to, which of course, nowadays we just have to use what we can see in front of us. We can't do better than that, but we don't excuse it. The behavior was wrong and we have to prevent that behavior. Maybe he needs a different type of way to prevent it. So we're saying, okay, he had his mental capacity is not good enough. Okay. But then how do we still prevent him from killing other people. We don't just let him out on the loose. That's not one of the options. Um, you know, that's that's not one of the options letting him to continue his behavior. We can't, you know, excuse that. So thank you for bringing that in, uh, B. Ellen, you had a question? Yes, um, I, I'm, I have two questions. One of them, um, you say that if you entice someone, you're guiltier than the person who committed the Avera. However, that means you cannot do it to Shuva? For someone who entices someone else, you can. You could still do teshuva for that. Yes. A person could repent for enticing somebody else. Um, absolutely. You know, just like you do. That is a sin. So now it becomes in the category of a sin. And you could repent. You could do teshuva for that sin also. Which would be the regular process of teshuva, which is first admitting that you did it. You know, recognizing that you did it. Regretting that you did it accepting upon yourself in the future not to do it again and then being in that circumstance and actually not doing it, again. Not doing it. my second question is you know, i'm trying to learn a little hebrew as we're doing this and it's not easy okay yeah so, uh, <laughs> we'll have to make a separate class for that learning hebrew but we, yeah, we can learn a few words love it and so i'm adam. trying to well everyone now knows the word adam man so let's make sure each class you know we at least cover one word okay go okay. ahead so you said um, that um, God said to, uh, what, uh, where are you, I believe it is? Where are you? And um, um, in, 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 you're talking about verse nine, where he said, uh, Ayeka, where are you? Correct. And when I'm looking at it, and he says to the 
Nachash. Right. Achalva. They, they okel. Is that the word? Where are you? They okel. To me, where is Afo? Well, Aye means also where. And right. Ayaka is a strange, Ayaka is actually is a strange language. It's not the usual, um, you know, common way that you would say. It would be more common uh, to say like Aye or, um, you know, but it is, it is used, but it's not the, the normal, the normal, um, I wouldn't say it's the typical way to say it, but it also, do, it does mean where are you, Ayaka. But if you're talking modern Hebrew nowadays, you would say Efoat or, Efo. yeah. Okay. But the word is Va'okel. Va, what, uh, I don't know if I'm here. Let me. Let me, you're talking no. about verse nine? Correct. Vayoymar, and he said, as kol chashamati, I have heard your voice, vagan in the garden, vaira, and I, oh, I'm reading, I'm sorry, I'm reading verse 10, no wonder. Vayikra Hashem, and Hashem right. called. Right. Vayikra means he called. Right. Elakim God, El Ha'adam to the person, by Yaimer, and he said, Loy to him, Ayeka, where Ayek. are you? So that, that means, where are I'm you? Not, the reason why it's Ayeka is because Aye is where, and the Achaf, or Akaf, could mean you um, at the end of a word. When you put when you put Achaf at the end of the word, word it means you. So together, okay. it means Ayeka, you know, where are you? Excellent. Thank you so much. No problem. So, okay. So now moving on, uh, uh, continuing on. Let's go into the, the first punishment. So the first punishment said, you are more cursed than all of the animals. That's, that's what he said. But if we look at the wording, okay. If we look at the wording over here, well, what does he say? He says, I'm going to put the spotlight here. So he says to the snake, you have done, you'll be cursed, more than all the cattle and more than all the beasts of this field. So I want everyone to look at this verse for a minute and tell me, does anything strike you? Could we have said this in a, different or shorter way because we know in the Tyra that any time that the Tyra tells us something it doesn't use extra words it only tells you what it needs to tell you so does anyone feel there's extra words in this passage that it could have been said in a shorter way because you have done this will be course more than all the cattle and more than all the beasts of the field does anyone think this could have been said in a shorter more clear way there's redundant. There's it's no redundant. Thank you. Which word should I knock out? Uh, cattle. Yeah. Okay, so cattle and beasts are actually two different, um, they're two different types. How about field? Okay, maybe. But even before that. I mean, I, I, would, um, I would get rid of the redundancy. It says... Um, you are, uh, I would, this part where it says uh, more than, it says more than twice. I would have just. Exactly. More than all is said twice. So if we, you see, I, I just put like a line through that. Does everyone see the blue where I put the line? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if we would knock that out, the Pusuk seemingly would be saying the same thing. Because look. Hashem said, because you have done all this, cursed be you more than all the cattle and the beasts of the field. What's it adding by saying, and more than all, a second time? Excellent. Okay, spot on. So now let's answer that question that you came up with. And that's, you know, when we study the text of the Torah, that's something, you know, important to 
to be realizing, you know, we only have a very limited of time, but you see over here, so a lot of this, you know, we're not like going so much inside the text, you know, but that's always how we have to look at the text because that's the way the commentaries are looking at the text always. Wait, is there an extra word? Could it be said differently? What's going on over here? How come, like we did before, how come the previous, you know, a passage when it spoke to Chava, it said it in a way of a comment and over here it's in a way of a question. And oh, if these words are extra, nothing's like, oh, he just happened to write it this way. Every single word, every single letter is so exact in the Tyra. So what do we have here? We have this idea. So now we have this question that you ladies came up with, which is, why does it have to say from all twice? It is redundant, as Ellen and Amy explained to us. So it seems strange that we have to put in this extra part of the phrase that you are, you know, more than all, could have just said, you will be cursed more than the animal, the beasts and animals. So that's our question. So Rashi, which is the simple explanation, explains this. And he says, he teaches that the, the, this was the punishment. The punishment was that the snake's pregnancy is going to be seven years. Now, how do we learn that from these words, from these extra words that pregnancy is gonna be seven years? So he says, because an animal is seven times more cursed. Okay, so another person asked a great question when we were when we were looking, and they said, "Well, why does it have to say both words of cattle?" Okay, if we look over here, it says cattle and beasts. Why do we have to say both? And a cattle is more um, th that is under the, the category of cattle would be like a donkey, for example, and beast would be more like a cat, okay? So it's two different types of animal. And that's what Rashi says, that the behema, which is like a donkey, is seven times more cursed than a chaya, which would be like a cat. And the cat is pregnant for, does anyone know how long a cat is pregnant for? Nope. 52 days. Oh, really? So, okay, a cat is pregnant for 52 days and a donkey is pregnant. Well, can anyone guess? And if you can't guess, how much longer is it pregnant than the cat? What did we just say? Seven times. Seven times. So what's 52 times seven? 300 and whatever. 364, which is one year. So the, the cat is pregnant for 52 days. The donkey, which is like in the category of an animal, is pregnant for a year. So he says that it is going to be more cursed than the animal which we said the animal is the donkey, but how much more cursed is he going to be than the animal? How much the animal, which is the donkey, is more cursed than the beast, the cat? So if the animal is seven times as much more cursed as the cat, so then the snake is going to be seven times as cursed as the donkey. So now... What is seven times one year? Seven years. <laughs> seven years. So how long is the pregnancy of the snake? Seven years. So he says that is the punishment. So that's why it has to say it twice because he's showing just like the, the donkey is seven times more pregnant. Well, I don't know, more pregnant, but is pregnant seven times longer than the cat. So that's how much more pregnant the snake is going to be than the, the behema, which is the animal, which would be the donkey, which would be seven years. So the snake is pregnant for seven years. So that's the first curse. Remember? 
that he's going to be cursed from all these animals. Practically speaking, what does that mean? How is he more cursed than all the other animals? Because he's going to have to have a pregnancy of seven years. Now let's go to the second curse. And remember what the second curse was? Dust. That's the third one. The belly. <laughs> the belly, exactly. He's going to have to crawl on the belly. So he used to walk on his feet, remember? He used to stand up like a human person and walk on feet. And now his feet are going to be cut off and he's going to crawl. So he's emphasizing the fact here, the contrast that he used to walk because it says he's going to go on his stomach. He could have just said he's going to crawl, but he says, no, he's going to go on his stomach because he's showing you used to go by your feet and walk like a human person. And now you're going to have to go on your, on your stomach and you're not going to be you're going to be going, but you're not going to have those feet anymore. Those feet are going to be cut off. Now let's go to the third, um, the third curse, the third punishment. And that is, as Esther just said, the offer teichel, and you will eat dust. Does anybody have a question on this? He now is going to eat dust. That's going to be his food. Who thinks this sounds like a good thing? Who thinks this sounds like a bad thing? So put up your thumbs if you think, hey, this is, this is pretty good. And put your thumbs down if you think it's bad. <laughs> Wouldn't want to eat dust. <laughs> so B says, uh-uh, wouldn't want to eat dust. Okay, any other opinions? <clears throat> how, you, how can you survive on dust? Well, Adam, if God says animal could survive in that, then he could survive in that. So that's not really an issue because. Does it have anything to do with death? With death? Just, that, yeah, that is a very interesting point that it says that when a, a person is, um, when a person dies, it says, <laughs> the offer tushov, and you shall return to dust, which that's means that we're supposed to be buried. Um, underneath it says that the the um, the soul doesn't really rest completely until it's buried under dust. And that's why we make sure to bury somebody as fast as we can and not push off the funeral and the burial. I mean, that's also, you know, connected to, we want to make sure to bury the person and not, God forbid, you know, cremate them because all their body parts are supposed to be buried underneath. And even if God forbid someone, dies, you know, a very terrible way, like, you know, the Surfside Towers last year, they had, um, you know, you know, here in Miami, I know the people who were very, you know, involved, um, it's called Chesed Shal MS, and they went to find every possible limb, anything they could find, they were there for weeks afterwards to identify them and put them back with the proper bodies to bury them properly, because Every part is really supposed to be buried properly underneath and says the soul doesn't really rest until the body is, you know, buried under earth. So yes, um, that is definitely, definitely true. Um, and he brought death in the world. So now he is, you know, has that, that connection. Excellent. That was a great, great insight that um, Ellen brought out. Um, but What's the advantage? So B says, Ech, I wouldn't want to really eat dust. But what's the advantage of eating dust? You know, when you say, oh, it's found like the dust of the earth, what, what does that mean? The Jewish people are compared, says, to the stars, because there's, you know, the stars of the heaven and the dust of the earth. Why are we comparing the Jews to the dust of the earth? So many. So many. So... so Dust, there's so many. It's everywhere. So wherever you go, you will have food. Whenever you want, you will have food. You will never be hungry. Your food will always be, and that's its proper food. So yes, I hear what some of you are saying, man, why would I want to eat dust? But guess what? If that's what he could survive on, it actually seems to be that he's always having food prepared and available for him wherever he goes, that doesn't seem very much like a curse. That seems, I mean, we wouldn't want to eat grass either, what the other animals are eating, you know? So it's, but, so we, we're like, this is the question that we have. 
why is the Tyra, why is the punishment making it so easy for him and so good for him that he will always have his food prepared and available to him wherever he goes? Because he didn't really sin? No, this is a strong punishment and he did sin. But that, that, is, that is a good answer. I, I, I hear where you're coming from on that. I haven't seen that anywhere. Um, then again, there's a lot of things I haven't seen, even though I've researched this topic uh, very intensely um, and, you know, read books and book, you know, lots of many, many commentaries and different books on it. You know, so it's possible that it says that somewhere, but I, I haven't seen that. But that's a good, that's, you know, interesting point. But the answer that, that I came across is, that we are withholding the snake from an opportunity. And this, this comes, this um, answer is given by the rim. And he says that we are withholding a very special opportunity from this snake. And what is this opportunity? The opportunity is to ask Hashem for food. And you say, what do you mean? What, what, what's the opportunity lost? When we don't have food, when I don't have something, what do I do? I turn to Hashem and I talk to Hashem and I connect to Hashem. And that's what tefillah, davening, praying, it actually, one of its translations, tafal means to connect. And when I pray, when I daven, I connect to Hashem. And he is so far away from holiness, this snake, because we said not only he's trying to get other people to disconnect from Hashem. And so he is so far away from Kedusha, so far away from holiness, that we don't give him the opportunity even to talk to Hashem and to connect to Hashem. Because when we need something, we remember Hashem, and we have this opportunity to connect. Now imagine someone who I love, I say, oh, here this is, let's enjoy it, let's talk, let's, but someone who I don't really want to have to deal with, I'm just like, I throw it to them. Oh, here, like, you know, let's even say I'm, I'm driving and I see, you know, a person who's collecting money and I'm a little bit like skeptical. Who is this person? Are they mentally stable? What are they going to do? Are they going to buy drugs with this money you know, or whatever? And I don't really want to get too involved. I'm a little bit nervous. You know, I want to protect and keep the distance. So I'm just going to take that food that I have, right? I have, let's say, some chips in the car or, you know, a nice apple, could be, you know, and I just kind of throw it and continue on, okay? So when you say, here, take this and go, that's not a loving, compassionate, that's not a relationship. So like that's sort of the way that Hashem is interacting with the snake. Here, take this and go. We don't want to have anything to do with it. There's no relationship. And we are very blessed that, yes, we have to work hard for our food, but, and sometimes we don't have, and sometimes we have more, but that gives us opportunity to look out and to have a relationship with Hashem. And there's a famous parable that's given that says that one time there was a king and he was drowning. And he was drowning in this um, river, uh, lake. And it happened to be that there was a pauper who was right near the lake and he saw him drowning. And so he went and he saved him and he pulled him out. And the king said, wow, I cannot thank you enough. You saved my life. Wow, wow, wow. I want you to come to the palace and I want you, don't tell me now, come tomorrow. And I want you, you could ask for up to half of my treasury because I wouldn't even be here if not for you saving me. And, you know, come take what you what you, you know, come collect your gift. And the man says, what do you mean? Like, obviously I saved you. Like, what else would a person do? No, 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 I want to give you your prize. Come, come. Anyways, so the next day he comes to the palace and he thought about it all night. And he comes to the king and the king says, so you had all night. Did you think about it? What did you choose? And he says, I want to come to the king three times a day. And converse with the king three times a day. And he's looking at him like, really? 
You could have gold. You could have silver. You could have rubies. I, there's so much I could offer you. And he said to him, I was a nothing. You spoke to me. Now I'm a something, a relationship. That's what I want. I want a relationship with the king where I could feel this is such an opportunity. Then I'm able to speak to you three times a day. That's what I want. And this is a parable for us praying every day. That we have an opportunity three times a day. Women are only, you know, obligated. It's only custom for women to dive in. Twice a day, of course, we're allowed to dive in three times a day. And, you know, there's the sitter, which we, has the proper words, which, of course, is a beautiful to do. We can also talk to Hashem. But we know that a lot of times we deep digger in when something is happening, you know, when I know that, you know, a dear, a close person to me is having a procedure, I'm going to connect more, I'm going to concentrate more, I'm, I'm going to say extra psalms then, I'm going to connect, and this is a privilege, this is an opportunity, and when we have everything perfectly in front of us, a lot of times we forget, and we don't do it, so this is an opportunity that the snake doesn't have, and they were, we are privileged to have. Um, Ellen, you have a question? Um, yeah, I, I feel as if there's another sin hidden in here because it's not only dust that will be everywhere, but you will eat it all the days of your life. And that's, that's hopelessness. There's no chance for him to do it. And that's, that's the worst thing that can happen to a person to have no hope. Right. And, and I, I, I see, I feel as if that's another sin that's, that's in that person. Another punishment, you mean? Correct. Punishment. Yes, yes, excellent, excellent. I, I, that, is, that is a beautiful, beautiful lesson. And that is showing that the snake, though he's going to have everything he needs, there's no room for growth. And it says, what is the idea? And that is connected. Um, I was going to connect it. It's also connected to what we said before, that his feet are being cut off. He is becoming different than the human being. The human being, why are we different from an animal? Because we're able to walk on our feet. Why are we different than the angels? Because we're able to walk and grow and get higher and higher. And we have our head upwards. We're able to look at God and talk to God and connect. So he's being deprived of both of these things. The connection, which is everything, you know, being whatever it is, whether it's your relationship with your husband, with your friends, with your children, with yourself, with God, with, if you don't have connection, you basically have nothing in your life. And so that is that he's being deprived of this relationship and connection. And he's also being deprived of, of, of being someone who could continue to walk, who could continue to grow, who could go up in life. And he is just as, Ellen said, he's just going to be now stuck forever. You're just going to be doing this. There's no hope of you to, to get at it, which is another tremendous gift that we have right. as women and as Jews. Uh, yes, B. Uh, does it actually say in <clears throat> somewhere in these passages that the snake at one time was upright and had feet? No, that's only in the commentaries. It does not say that anywhere in, in the actual verses. That's what I thought. But we do see that he is talking to her and he's having a conversation. Oh, yeah. So we see that obviously he's not just like a regular, you know, animal. Um, you know, we do, we do see that. Um, so the, the, the next thing is, so we see that he... The, the sins are parallel to the punishment. So we see he sinned like he dared to go to Gan Eden. He walked into a place where he shouldn't have been. Parallel to that, his legs are cut off. We see that he spoke against God, right? God said, don't do this. And he basically contradicted God's words. So that's why he's going to be his mouth. He used his mouth to sin by speaking. So now he's going to have to eat. His mouth is going to be in this punishment where he's going to have to eat inferior food. And then we're going on to the third, um, this, I mean, the stomach and the speaking go together, but now we're going to go on to the third, where he, he entices Chava, 
And it says that improper love turns into hatred. When a relationship relationship starts off all about lust and just, you know, for one's body and not really for the person, as we discussed last time, we want to see our hands, our actions, our, our eyes, our face, what we think, what we feel. When a person doesn't get in a relationship with the real person of who they really are, but just for lust, then it will end off in hatred in a bad way. And that's the fourth uh, punishment that it says that, that they're going to have this hatred between the snake and Chava, which we'll have to talk about next time in our next session. We'll discuss that last punishment. Okay, thank you all for joining today. If anyone has a question or wants to stay on afterwards, you're welcome to. Uh, otherwise, everybody have a great day, and I hope to see you all on Tuesday. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you very you. much. My pleasure. Have a good, good rush, Good rush,